Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. So we're going to begin condensing this stuff down and it's going to disappear quickly. It looks a lot worse than it actually is. I don't know that we're going to get through everything in this installment because, well, I'm not, I'm going to try not to do any more 27 minute long uploads. It's just too taxing on my system, on my computer, on my internet speed. Out here, we have what I call Model T internet. You can have any speed you want so long as it's slow. And the only way I can get any faster internet is to move closer to population centers. And in today's world, if it ever came to moving, I would be heading in the opposite direction. So let's get started. There, we've cleared off just a little bit of a space to work. So where to begin? Um, you know, think of this as a puzzle. Most mechanical things are a puzzle. Reconditioning aspect aside, they come apart and they go back together like a puzzle. And they're the best kind of puzzle because you can drive them when you're done. <laughs> you know, that's how I look at it. So let's just start with a few simple pieces. We can do this oil line, okay? You know, so we got the, the line and the bracket for it and nuts and washers right there. And we have the two fittings. And we have an oil cup times two. So what we have in frame right here is all we need to be thinking about right now. This is a perspective that goes all the way back to my tech school days. Don't look at it in its entirety. None of that stuff even matters. Put it out of your mind. This is all we really need to focus on at this point in time. Not that many pieces here. And it's fairly self-explanatory. So going back to the puzzle analogy, the parts manual here is basically the picture that's on the box okay everything that we're gonna deal with on this whole bench is either on this page or this page there's your picture on the box supplement that with the service manual that is a step-by-step -step guide as to how to put all those puzzle pieces together supplement it still with a book like this this is basically journal entries of the field servicemen okay this is years and years of real world experience when these things are being flogged hard every day and still we're expected to produce this is hard fought hard won knowledge that is at our fingertips we didn't have to actually go out and earn that for ourselves what i'm getting at with this arm yourself with as much information as possible manuals manuals and more manuals it makes your life so much easier when you're working on machines like this and combined with hopefully the video entries, the logs that I've been leaving. Hopefully anybody at the end of this series can take a D2 apart and put it back together. That's kind of the goal of what we're doing here. So with that out of the way, sorry, I get off on tangents from time to time. Um, I want to talk about these new little spring cap. Here we go, one hand, there you go. Spring cap oil cups that I sourced for 1113 as both of the old ones were broken in the hinge area and pretty well stuck. That's common for these. This is the early first gen, only used up until 5J1178. After that, they went to a much different design, but these are the 4B350 oil cup. And couldn't find these available anywhere, but I, okay, we'll just put them there. I got these from the McMaster Car Company, and they're, they're a pretty close uh, facsimile of the original ones. The new ones are a little bit larger. And I'll throw the part number for these on the screen here so you can have it for your records in case you uh, want to know. But so with that out of the way, we can start putting this stuff together. So these fittings go in first. Again, this first gen design, the later cases, did away with these large fittings and they just went straight pipe thread right through this area of the case and just threaded everything right into the heavy cast. Much more efficient setup. And with both of those tight, next comes the brass line fittings. They thread onto the bottoms of these fittings up inside the case in here. And due to the difficulty of this shot, we're only catching this one on this side. There we go. Working by braille a little bit. We'll tighten this in with a wrench, but there's no way I can fit the camera in here at the same time. Now, the lines and the brackets. And you're going to find the easiest time by starting the line in the bracket like that and starting the bracket on the studs and then going up in here and starting the line up on that fitting and with the line only finger tight so that it can move a little bit I put the lock washers and the nuts on the bracket 
So at this point, we can tighten the bracket and then tighten the line and repeat for the other side. Then to finish it off, the new oil caps go on the very top. Okay, both of the oil caps are tightened in and we've got the oil delivery system in place, fully installed. That wasn't so bad, so let's clear some more pieces from the bench. <laughs> we can do some corner pieces, right? So we have the actuator lever for the steering clutch and the bearing and the shaft, and then we have the spring, the acorn nut and the washer for the pull rod. Again, Times two, one talking point worth mentioning, the needle bearings that run inside these actuators are extinct. There are no new left in the parts chain and I have not been able to source any new old stock either. So good used is what I'm down to. I have a few of these because every time I dismantle the D2 back end, I pull those shafts to see if we have good bearings to salvage. Most of the time you see something that looks like this because in their stock form, once they're assembled, you don't have any way of putting any more lubrication into these things unless you pull those shafts and manually put some in there. For me, that's not a big deal because maintenance like that is basically sport. So some specs on those bearings. The cat number was a 4B5353 and it's a high at 93420 at the end of the day. Now, if you had to go the bearing route but you didn't have any good use, you can use a McGill MR14SS. Mr. HFDZL in the comment section supplied me with that data right there. The only thing he cautioned is the 1.250 diameter bore in the actuator lever must be oversized to a 1.375 to fit that McGill MR14SS and to round out the specs, he signs off as Herb. Thanks buddy, I appreciate that info. And another option still is to just turn out an oil light bushing that fits the existing diameter of that actuator and also fits the diameter of the shaft. That's something that on its own will last a long, long time without you having to take this stuff back apart and add any more lubrication. So to start with, we'll put the springs and the washers on the pull rods. Each pull rod is covered in grease. I like to even coat the springs and the washers with grease. These things are in a pretty harsh environment, so give them all the help that they can get. We start by putting the springs on. Washers go on next. And we'll pivot the steering levers back and tuck those up out of the way. We can put the actuator lever in next, but first I want to show you how the pins fit. So you can see they have a step with a smaller diameter on the bottom right here. So coming in from the top, they are a light press fit in this upper bore, but that step goes in the lower bore and it's a slip fit in there. So pretty simple, you just drive these down until that step shoulder right there hits that lower bore and they're fully installed. And when you get all this stuff really clean, the bore is really clean and the shaft is really clean, these tap in without a lot of trouble. So I know they can really be a bear pulling out when they're all rusty, but when everything is like it should be, <laughs> life is pretty good. So, so we've got our actuator lever, grease in the pocket up there. We have our bearing packed full. We do this, try and do this without my hands completely being in the way. Slide that in there and just make sure we can start the pull rod in that end of it. Grease on the pin and I just take a fine thread 3 8 bolt with a stack of washers, start that in the top. I'd much rather hammer on that than the top of the pin. Sound like it bottomed out. Yep, fully installed. Repeat for the other side. And with both levers in, the final thing we do is install the acorn nuts on the end of the pull rods. Once again, I've got grease on these things. And we're not going to put these in their final position because they have to be adjusted along with steering clutch pack 
free play and lever position and you know we'll we'll do all of that probably once the final drives are on even that's when you everything's finally in place and you can really start um, adjusting things and you know where everything has to end up so because these are retained by cotter pins or split pins as I'm often reminded that go through the, the slot that's in the head so okay this will give you a little bit of an idea how those work with the steering levers so simple as that right on to the next well we've opened up a little bit of a hole let's clear things off a little more here so we have the, the clutch yokes and the adjuster bolt and the pinch bolt and nut for the adjuster bolt pretty simple assembly you can see I've got the adjuster bolt in the top pinch bolts in the top I have the swivel pad on the bolt packed with grease grease on all the threads here grease on the pivot ball at the bottom I've packed the socket with grease are you noticing a theme here yes grease because as I've said before these compartments like to build condensation so I give this stuff a lot of help so pretty simple to install we need to kick it sideways to get that adjuster bolt up through like that once it's up in the top straighten it back out pivot ball goes down in the socket at the bottom that's it And with that, not only do we have the oil delivery system in place, we have the entire clutch control system in place as well. And you know, when you look at it in its entirety, it can look like it's a little bit busy in there, but just breaking it down one small subsection at a time, it's pretty easy to wrap your head around. So now we can begin with the assembly of the steering clutches. So let's condense this stuff down a little bit more. First thing we can do is put the new release bearings into the bearing cages. Now, cat number for these was a 2B9338, and they're just a standard 7211 thrust bearing. Pretty common. You'll have no problem picking these up aftermarket. They're all about the same quality anymore. So uh, one thing you want to make sure of is to assemble these in the cages properly because there is a thrust face on the outer race and a thrust face on the inner race. So take a look at it. We can see the back side of the outer race is pretty much open. Nothing really holding any of the balls in there. So we know this is the thrust face right here of the outer race. So if we put that thrust face down into the bottom of the bearing cage, that's proper assembly. If you get that backwards, you're just gonna pull that thrust bearing apart just like we did in the press, trying to press the old ones out. Um, one other interesting thing I want to show you with these cages, you know, we have this oil feed system that comes in through these hollow bolts that go into there. And you'll notice these cut out pockets on each side. The oil is going to run through that bolt and it's going to come in behind the outer race. It's going to get into that pocket. It'll roll down into this closed off portion here, eventually accumulate and run into the bearing and the bearing will circulate it all throughout itself. So. Pretty simple how that lube system works. We'll get this one positioned properly the same way. And then we'll take these to the press, press them in. Another thing I choose to do is pack these bearings with grease, at least from this open side anyhow. I know we have an oiling system that's bringing lubrication into them, but it's just a little bit more help to, uh, to give to them inside those compartments. And it's not going to pose a problem because the oil coming in is eventually going to mix with the grease, thin it out, and it's all going to find its way to the bottom of that compartment anyway. So with the bearings in, we can find homes for a few more of these pieces. So we have our metal kind of dust ring, deflector ring. The center should be domed up. So we'll place each one of those on top of a bearing and we can retain them with the ring.
Next we can take the six pins and put them into the pressure plate. We can take the pressure plate and the nut and the bearing all over to the vise. Start the bearing on the hub and I'll just tap it on. I want to only tap on the inner race because that is the direction that these are meant to thrust. I don't want to tap on the cage. That might risk pulling it apart. So we have an old inner race that's going to be an excellent stand-in as a driver. It's stuck on the grease. There we go. <laughs> Nut goes on next. Okay, wrench on. And if you're really lucky, oh man, that's close. If you're really lucky, <laughs> those set screw holes line right up with each other. I think I can get it. We're so close to being there. Perfect. You didn't just see that. And here's where you need to keep the nut matched to the hub because if you don't, chances are the threads for these set screws are never going to line up again. So now we restake the nut. A little bit more. Good on that one. I don't want to use the old holes over again because our metal's a little bit fatigued over there. So we're just, uh, we're doubling up. Calling that good. Okay, one better view of the staking. You can see, hopefully, these GoPros are awesome with details, how we actually displace some of the metal just over the top of that set screw on each side. So everything's good here. And of course, repeat for the other side. So now we look at the center hubs. And you really want to assess these. You want to make sure none of those through holes are getting too oblong. Make sure the splines in the center are good. Make sure these splines here that the steel inner toothed discs engage with are all good. We can see some faint witness marks on there, but I'll tell you what, these are as close to new as you're going to find in a D2. And just for reference, I cleaned up an old hub from 2115. I mean, what can I say? Worst case scenario every time, but you can see how much wears on those splines. Like that one, right off the end of my fingers, just about worn through. Some of those get pretty skinny. So yeah, this is uh, this is shot because you put new discs on all those old hangups there and it's just gonna cause you problems. So I don't know how many times you need to cycle a D2 steering clutch to put that kind of wear on it, but 2115 could tell you. Now, to finally talk about these brand new steering clutch discs I have here, this is the bimetallic disc, and it's a definite upgrade over the original riveted organic style. Centered bronze is what comes to mind. I can't find that to, uh, to verify. It's been years and years since I've read it, but it's the bimetallic type, and they are a definite upgrade. They won't swell, they won't rust, they won't stick. On machines like these D2s that sit a lot, this is the only way to go as far as I'm concerned. It is well worth the investment. We have new frictions and new steels. So the steels are the same dimension as the originals. Nothing is different there. But 
if we compare the thickness of an original organic versus the thickness of the bimetallic, you can see the bimetallics are quite a bit thinner. So whereas we had eight frictions, eight steels in the original pack, it takes 12 frictions and 12 steels of the newer bimetallics to get us there. And that's the magic number for the D2. Now I get these from General Gear and Machine. Great people, I'll pop all their contact information up here. You can, you know, have that to put in your log, use for reference material if you want. And you can see the friction discs are an 8E7628. The steel discs are a 4B3532. And frictions are $18 a piece. Steels are $10 a piece. So by the time you buy 24 of each, you can see 672 that purchase is not for the faint of heart but you'll never regret it if you go to these this is what the iron mistress has in it and seniors d2 the 5u 4399 we have to do a lot of steering clutch work back there his is probably going to get these completely worth it at the end of the day now shop manual procedure for putting these clutches together what they would have you do is take the center hub just as it's sitting here and place it down inside of a brake drum so i brought an old brake drum up out of my pile so you know what we're talking about. You would then stack all the discs, alternating friction steel, friction steel, that perfectly aligns interior teeth, exterior teeth, and then, well, you'd have a long eight inch through bolt in there once you get everything placed in and the pressure plate on top, you put a washer and nut on top of it, cinch it together, pull it out of the drum, flip it over, put it in your compressor tool, compress the springs, put on the keepers, put on the locks. And, and to me, that's kind of tedious. That's not the way I do it. I've been building automatic transmissions for enough years to have gotten pretty good at aligning splines on discs. So this is um, <laughs> this is pretty gravy compared to some of that stuff. So you start with a friction, back it up with a steel, and you just want to make sure, see the frictions can float on here a little bit. The steels are pretty much located by the splines that are on that hub. So you just kind of keep everything concentric and just alternate friction steel, friction steel. You don't have to have these perfect as you're going up, but just get them close. Now we can set the pressure plate on top. And one thing I may have forgot to mention before, hopefully you can see it with this GoPro, you can see a lot of crisscross grooves in that bushing down in there. And there's a lot of black stuff in there. Don't dig that black stuff out, that's graphite. So that's all impregnated in there. Makes it a self lubricating bushing, so that's very important. And yes, we end with a steel disc on top against the steel of the pressure plate. That's just how they did it, never seemed to be a problem. So. I know that came up in the comment section a couple times beneath the last video. So we'll align the pins, drop that on there, and we'll take this over to the vise. These bimetallic discs are a bit heavier than the originals. Now we just shore everything up. If I can fit a standard flat file between all these teeth, they're pretty well aligned. Make sure everything looks concentric all the way around. Good. Now we can stack springs. And I did evaluate all of these original springs from 1113 and you know what? I'm using them all over again. I had sourced a whole box. Let's see where we are here, right there. Whole box of new inners and outers. Prior to taking any of this stuff apart, expecting that we are gonna have some problems with these and I just don't need to use them on 1113. We've discussed the uh, um, tension specs on these at their compressed assembled lengths before. I can pop that video link up right there. That was when we were taking the rusty and stuck steering clutch pack off of 2115, but we're getting a little long on time, so we don't need to get into all that right now. 
think those new springs are going to find a home in the back end of Senior's 5U instead. So compressor disc on. All right, so at some point in time, you do need to stop and make sure the pins are starting to come up through the centers of these keepers. <clears throat> Things like to move around. So you just have to babysit it and get everything started in square. That one's looking good. That one's looking good. Because you don't want to have the keeper hang on the top of the pin and then the bottom of the pin's just bearing down on the release bearing cage and you're just loading up more and more and more tension. So, pays just to take a couple minutes, babysit things a little bit, make sure everything looks happy, and continue on. There, should have enough. All right, so to put the keepers in, or the locks, I, well, we'll call them keepers. It's kind of like doing a regular valve. I coat them with grease because that helps them stick once they uh, once they go on the end of the pin. And then I just dance them in with a little angle pick. So now that I have the camera on, it's probably going to uh, resist what I'm trying to make it do. This is the last set. I got all the rest of them in. So something decides to blow apart at this point. It shouldn't. Hopefully, shouldn't go too far. There's the first one. Apply some grease to the second one. Drop it in. There, that one behaved itself right from the start. Look at that. All right, all six sets are in. We can crank the tension off. We'll just watch from a distance, make sure all of those keepers are settling into the retainers properly. So far looking good. And just like that, pressure's off. Out of the danger zone now. We're just finishing up with the last of the new thickness checks. Did I forget to mention? Repeat all the same steps for the other side. And with the new discs, bimetallic frictions, new steels, both of our steering clutch packs are right at three inches now, and that's much more in line with the uh, the book spec new of two and seven eighths. I like that better than the three and one eighth that we had. Of course, I'm you know pretty sure we had some. Swelling due to rust, maybe some moisture had been uh, soaked up in those, what have you. So now, just take a minute. Bear in mind that, you know, everything that used to be on this bench, or most of it, is still here. We put a few pieces in back here, you know, between both sides. But by and large, we still have that whole bench full of stuff laid right out in front of us. It's just that now most of it's taken up in these two sub-assemblies and we have just some miscellaneous hardware, some fold-over locks. So like I said before, don't look at it in its entirety. Just break it down into subsections and only focus on that. Disregard the rest of that and it becomes a lot less intimidating. There's really not you know as much to it when you do that. So we're gonna cut the video right here. I know I said going into this, I'm not doing another 27 minute long video and looking at the files on the camera now, I think there's more under this time than there was last time. What can I say? So, all right, we'll cut it here. Um, next time we will, we'll, don't mess it up now, Squatch. Next time we will press steering clutches onto the bevel gear shaft, get all that stuff finalized, hopefully finish up with the rest of the transmission details, and then we'll be free to move on to the next, whatever that may be. So, as always, everybody, thank you for watching. Thanks for the subs, the likes, the views spreading the word and as always memberships available down below you guys know the routine with that right now we caught some 
a little bit of behind the scenes stuff in the recording of this and I'll pop some of that stuff up on the members page you know, tomorrow probably and then a couple days later we'll have this up and rolling. Thanks everybody. I got to stop talking. Hope to see you back again. <laughs>